morning, everyone. God indeed is good, isn't he? Um, excuse me. If I didn't have reminders. <laughs> How are you? Are you well? You well? Very good. We um. There's someone sitting next to you, right? No one here. Only my beloved is sitting by herself. Um, well, this is not good. We do not. Bow your heads with me. I want you to pray for the person next to you. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your precious, precious love, your wonderful grace, your glorious mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us each and every day. And I pray for this brother, this sister that is next to me right now. Pray, Lord God, that you would bless their hearts this morning. Lord, that today they would truly know that you are with them, that your comfort is there, your assurance is there, your peace is there, your love is there and embraces them this morning. Bless this brother, bless this sister, I pray, that you might, Father, raise them up to be a blessing wherever you take them. Thank you for them, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, okay, good news. Oh, good news, yes. yes. <laughs> it's almost good news. Yeah. Well, just a quick update on the um, uh, visitors. Um, please, please um, welcome visitors, by the way. It's great to see you. But if you would um, indulge us, just ask for a moment. We're in the midst of a of a, a building pro not a building program, but we're we're, we're moving towards buying our, our home, this, this, this building. So um, just um, so at the moment we are we're pretty much there. Um, six months ago, the Lord, um, you know, we, we had a meeting. I'll, I'll quickly again. You, you, you're going to get this again. Um, six months ago. We had a meeting, the elders of this church, leaders of this church had a meeting and we had this very impromptu conversation that wasn't on our agenda about what would happen if we had to get out of this building and uh, what would our response be and of course in that room of very wise and spiritual people, you know, we all rested back in our assurance of the greatness of our God who would take care of everything and said some things like, well, this is what we would do. Time, you know. We're going to either buy this building or we are going to, you know, the Lord will lead us, blah, blah, blah. With great confidence. I walked away from that meeting feeling uh, great. And it was a very hypothetical discussion. Well, but two days later, the owner of this building rang me <laughs> and said, um, um, I need to get rid of the, the building. So you guys need to make a decision. <laughs> and of course, we met again, these wise and very faithful men of God, and, and, and we met again, and I noticed, look, the confidence was still there. Look, it was still there. But certainly the, 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 the tenor of the meeting was very different. But there was a confidence, you know, and so we set about, and we made some inquiries, and we've been keeping you up to date, and so on. Um, and there was a there was a figure we had to arrive at, which was two hundred and twenty-five thousand. We had two two figures. Two hundred twenty-five thousand was our, our our deposit for a loan. Six hundred eighty thousand is approximately what we need to pay for the building. And so now, so that was that was six months ago. Um, we had another meeting with the owner and said, well, okay, look. I told him the story of our meeting um, and, um, and said, what, what, what time frame are you looking at? And he, 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 he leaned back in, in his, his chair and said, well, let's, you know, let's look at 12 months. Um, a week later, no, two weeks later, I think it was. Maybe longer, three weeks later? I can't remember. He said, uh, we got a phone call saying, look, we're going to have to bring that forward six months. And uh, so... That, that, that deadline was um, still confident. 
Yeah. <laughs> that, that deadline was either, was either last week or the week before, I think, something like that. And um, so just to let you know that um, um, as of right now, you've probably read it in your bulletin. It's a little bit more than that. So at the moment, we are about $217,000. So, we're, so, so that's amazing. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Two hundred seventy thousand dollars. You know, members of the group, two hundred seventy-eight, three point five years. One Eight grand. Eight grand. So we are actually in process at the moment of applying for the loan. Okay, because we believe that will come in. Okay, we know God will do that. And. Um, and who knows, by the time we go for the loan, um, maybe we'll have 680000 <laughs> God is honestly just amazing me. So, uh, uh, God is good. Yes. Right. So, guys, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. It's, um, it's blowing my mind completely. And this, I mean, this shows how much this fellowship loves the body of Christ and loves each other because this is our home. And um, we're, we're one family and um, this is where we gather. It's only a building, but it just means a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it's a place that we can gather and uh, serve one another, encourage one another, worship our God. And um, let's see what happens next. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Thank you, people. And, and the thing that's really... I mean, I've been, I've been this past few days. Once we looked at the numbers, have been the word I, I, was look, I was looking for a word to describe how I felt, and, and it basically, I've been staggered. Really. That's that's the word. It, it just staggered me really, because and I, I said to you in the very beginning of this little process, um, I just want to know what your will is. You know, I, we thought we knew what where God was leading us, but I needed to know the will, your will. Of, and obviously that's an express, been expressed in your support for what we believe God is doing. So, so uh, we'll keep you updated as as things unfold. Okay. Again, if you've got any questions about the process and how things are happening, please ask us. Because I um, so, uh, oh, just just a quick thing, uh, just a reminder: if you want to donate, uh, just oh, sorry, you want to donate just. Head to our website, all the information is on there. Okay, so www.carrychapelalbany.com.au and um, go to the Legacy Building Fund, which is directly on the front page. Just click Legacy Building Fund and it'll take you to all the info. Okay? Yeah. Pleasure. Oh, we've got our app. Who's got our app? We've got our app. There you go. Okay. Um, I wanna, we want to pray for um, little Zoe. Um, Olivia and Isaac's little girl. Yeah. Um, she's spent the night in hospital with some, with some chest, uh, some chest um, issues. So again, let's, if you wouldn't mind, praying with us, Father in heaven, we do again want to bless you and pray and praise you and honour you and thank you for your, as we have sung, your goodness towards us, and your unfailing presence within our lives, and Lord, your promise to watch over and keep. And we do pray, Lord God, that little Zoe, Lord, even in her young age, would, 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 would know in some way of your presence that overshadows her right now. Most certainly um, that Olivia and Isaac would know that and the comfort that you would bring them. We thank you for the good reports that we've received and pray, Lord God, that you would uh, just bring about a, a speedy recovery. But we also want to pray for little August. Um, making his way to Perth for, for another surgery, Lord, we just pray that um, you're there. And thank you, Father, again, for your faithfulness in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, we'll be back in Ephesians next week. Is that okay? Um, turn with me to Mark's Gospel, if you will. Um, let's go to chapter 10. And uh, now, is it stuffy in here? Yeah. It is. Are those windows open? 
I know I said about to open them. They're open. Opened one lot of them, sir. Very efficient. All right. Um, there goes another one. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> This verse, I want to look at one verse. I know it's not our, I know it's not our way, but we will look at other verses, of course. Um, this one verse in Mark 10, verse 45, which a lot of people say is the heart of the, the heart of the defining statement of Christ um, towards the gospel uh, in the gospel of Mark. And it simply is this: For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. For many. For many people, this verse is one of the most precious statements that Jesus made towards his church. And again, I can understand that. He came not to be served, but to serve. He came to give his life a ransom, payment for many. The Creator God, this is a thing that we are contemplating here this morning. The Creator God of heaven and earth, veiled himself, and we say this so often in this church, don't we? He veiled himself in human flesh to be our servant. That's hard to say, isn't it? But it's a, it's a truth, right? To be a servant and to be our redeemer. We can say that much easier, can't we? He's our redeemer, the one who pays. That word redeemer literally means... It's only used twice here in, the, in that particular word, here in the Gospel of Matthew, where, it's, where it says that you know, to be redeemed, to redeem or to or set someone free from bondage, from slavery. That's a broader sense of the, broader sense of the word, right? And, and we understand that, don't we? The writer of Hebrews alludes to this, um, this, uh, this reality of God veiling himself in flesh and, and coming to serve and to redeem. It says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, where again it speaks of the, the, the access that we have of God, to God through Christ, when he says, having therefore, brethren, boldness, this is our access, right, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And then verse 20, by a new and a living way, notice this, which he has consecrated for us, how? Through the veil that is his body, his flesh. And Jesus, all that God is, his divinity, his divine attributes, the exercising of those divine attributes, his glory, they were all concealed under the veil of flesh. Fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, in the prophecy that we so often, we so often uh, uh, receive on, Christ on Christmas cards, or we so often quote at Christmas time, when it simply says, His name shall be called what? Emmanuel, meaning what? God with us. In veiled glory, God came to serve and to save. I want you to think about it this morning. In veiled glory, God came to serve and to save. God, who the Bible says dwells in, un in light unapproachable in 1 Timothy chapter 16. I want you to think about the pre-incarnate existence of God, of Christ. I mean, someone wrote this. If they said, one problem, or sorry, our problem is not that we can't find God. Our problem is that we, can't, we couldn't come near him if we did. Now, look, that's, that's a great little saying, isn't it? Because all through the Bible, we find the very best of man, all through the Bible, we find the very best of man uh, unable, to, uh, unable to be present before God. We have wonderful examples where in Isaiah, again, familiar verses, where Isaiah, given a vision, you know, his entire book, he introduces it as a vision that God gave him. And God gives him a vision. Bear in mind, just a vision of God's glory filling the heavenly temple. Remember his response? In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, he said, Woe is me, 
For I am undone. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In that wonderful vision, Isaiah also sees the seraphim, this created being, hovering above the throne of God with six, with six wings. You know, there are wings, it's a glorious scene. You know, there are three that are folded in front of him. There are, sorry, three. There are two wings folded in front of the seraphim. And Another two wings are, are, are flying, are suspending him above the throne, and there's still another two wings that cover his face before the presence of the, of the glory of God. It's amazing, isn't it? He's a created being that is meant to be there. He's to veil his eyes from before the presence of the God whom he worships. Woe is me, he says, I am undone because I'm an unclean man and I live amongst unclean people. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Again, Jesus, sorry, John was given again by way of vision, that vision of the glorified Christ in the book of Revelation. And what did John do? He fell at his feet before the Lord as dead, we're told in Revelation chapter 1. The psalmist said uh, in Psalm 104, in the first verse, bless the Lord, he's quoting this, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, you are very great, you are clothed with honour and majesty, who covers yourself with light as with a garment. Think about that, he is transcendent. This is what's been described here, he's beyond the grasp of our physical, our mental, of our beyond the grasp of our physical, mental and emotional capabilities to be able to truly embrace you know, Spurgeon spoke more eloquently than, than I could ever when he said this, Who coverest thyself, quoting again that psalm, Who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, wrapping the light around him as a, as a monarch puts on his robe. The conception is sublime, sublime, Spurgeon says, but it makes us feel how altogether inconceivable the personal glory of the Lord must be if light itself is but his garment and veil, but what must the blazing splendor of his own essential being? We are lost in astonishment and dare not pry into the mystery, lest we be blinded by its insufferable glory. You know, knowing the unapproachableness of God, Martin Luther simply describes him as God hidden. From us. And if he had not revealed himself to us, this is the thing, isn't it? If God had not revealed himself to us, if God had not come down from his holy habitation, man could have no knowledge of him, much less be able to be in his presence. And this is God. This is God who made a way for us to know him, to one day to be translated into his very presence. This is God who came and found a way to do that, or made a way to do that by veiling himself and restricting his glory from the ultimate expression that it would have upon sinful mankind, and that is destroying us. Stop and think about his incarnate reality. Stop and think about what it is. We, we worshipped God this morning, didn't we? You lifted your voices, and you know that your heart's voice ascended before the very throne of grace. You know that you are worshipping God with angels, don't you? Here's the thing. I don't know. I think, I think maybe you're like me. Sometimes when we sing those songs and our heart and our mind begin to meditate upon the reality of the God that we worship, sometimes these words, they, they, just, they just pale, don't they? They really do. And sometimes I find myself listening to you worship and listening to the words that are being said and I just find myself going, thank you. Thank you. And... and and, and, and it's as close as I can get. But at the same time, it, it's, it's so insufficient, isn't it? 
this language that we have and this capacity that we have to be able to embrace the holiness and the righteousness, the, the justice, the majesty that is God. It just doesn't carry, does it? You know, I was with the young adults the other day at night and we're going through the book of Revelation and uh, we're in the fourth chapter. And we began, with the young adults began to look at that heavenly scene and... Um, and uh, again, the, the, the created beings that are before the throne of God. And, and, and it just dawned on me as I was as we were trying to describe these, the cherubim, magnificent created beings. And, they, and seemingly their sole purpose is there before the throne of God to worship. And, and, I, and, I, and I thought about this, and I thought, these beings, their sole purpose, created to worship the creator of heaven and earth. And I, and I read what they have. I think they were like me. No, they're not like me. But holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who is and was and is to come. That's it. And then you know what happened after that? They fell down before him. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, you know, here is God, and here are these created beings, purpose to worship the God in all his majesty and all his glory. And they did sound a bit like me. Thank you. You are holy. You are worthy. Words that seem to sometimes feel so insignificant, but here are these created beings. Holy. Holy. You know why it is? You know why I think it is? Because there's only one being that's God. You know that? There's only one being that is God. Everything else, whether they be angels, cherubim, seraphim, you and I, ants or whatever it is, they're not God. And the expanse between God and everything else is so immense. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how lofty a position we might find or feel that we are in. I think the best is just simply holy, holy. You are holy. We, we, we are not. I, 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 want you to, I want you to try and grasp, if you would, the pre-incarnate reality of Christ. And to think about those things. For if he had not revealed himself, we could not know him, right? could not know him. The God who has made a way, let me say it again, a way for us to know him by entering into our realm. Isn't that something? He entered into our realm as a man veiled. Right? The fact that the creator himself came in human flesh, and John in his gospel in the opening chapter makes that so apparent. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Go down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh, and tabernacle dwelt amongst us. You came to be a servant. You came to be a saviour, a redeemer. Now, isn't that staggering? Isn't it? Verse 45 again, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Context is everything again. This was said in light of two disciples, if you read back a few verses, two disciples coming to Jesus and asking if they could sit at either side of him when he reigns in his glory. Remember John chapter 17, we've got that high priestly prayer, you know, and Jesus is preparing himself for the garden, for the arrest, for the brutality of it all, for the crucifixion and the ascension into glory. And he prayed, Father, remember the prayer? That you would glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the creation, you know? Think about that. Right. Here are two disciples arguing over who could sit at his right and his left. You know, 
Uh, who's more important? And he, they want to be more important than these, these other ten that are gathered around. I, I love those scenes because I can only imagine in the disciples the moment they get an inkling of what's going on there. Um, the eyes, I can imagine the, you know. But they wanted the elevated position in the kingdom. They've got no concept of what they're asking for. In fact, that's what Jesus said. You've got no idea what you're asking for. And then he called all of the disciples to himself. And this is when they go, ah, what are these, what are these two up to, right? And Jesus says this to all of them. He says, you know, verse 42 in our, past, in, in our chapter, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so amongst you. But whoever desires to become great amongst you shall be your servant. And whoever desires, whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. Why? Here it is. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for money, for many. For the multitude that many, that is. He's presenting himself as the ultimate example to the disciples, right? Of what it looks like to pursue true greatness. And, so, and, and again, understand this, to pursue true greatness, not in this world, but in the kingdom of God. And when, he said, when we say the kingdom of God, I'm not talking about the eternal kingdom of God. I'm talking about the kingdom of God right here and right now. That's what he's talking about, Okay. And he's presenting himself as the greatest singular example of what that is. For even the Son of Man. And this is the term that Jesus most frequently used of himself. It comes from the it's a messianic title that comes from Prophet Daniel. And uh, speaking of the coming king, back in Daniel chapter 7, let me read this to you in verse 13. When it says, excuse me, when it says, I was watching in the night vision and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. It's a prophetic picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming as King of kings and Lord of laws, the chief over all of humanity, declaring his divine authority as received from the ancient of days. But at the same time, it's also indicating to us uh, of associ uh, him associating himself deeply with mankind. Again, one like the Son of Man. It's just, it's, it's just overwhelming, isn't it? When you take the time to stop and contemplate. Jesus comes. He came. He came into this world. When it says he comes or he came, obviously it's speaking about his eternal nature because he came from somewhere, didn't he? Right? And, and, you know, and he, in superior, in rank, you might say, and status over all of humanity, he comes with the authority of God Yet he walks amongst us as one of us, having fellowship with us. He is our intimate point of contact between our Creator and ourselves, marred by our fallenness and our brokenness and our, our rebellion. He becomes that intimate point of contact for fallen humanity. And he gives us what we need. He alone is that point of contact. He alone gives us what we need. He blesses our lives. You know, the Bible tells us the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, doesn't it? Right? You know? Now, no, no, again, so Jesus comes into this world. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You see, we don't, talk about us now, we don't come into this world we're born into this world, right? We're born into this world. We're a part of it. 
We don't come into this world from somewhere else, from outside of this world. Jesus came into this world and not being a part of this world. And that's very, very important for you and I to understand. Very important connected to our salvation. So let me say again, he was born into this world without ceasing to be God. We agree with that, don't we? If you don't, you're in the wrong church. He was born into this world without ceasing to be God, which means he alone was able to remain untouched by the sin and the guilt that we all fall to, right? Because we're of our father, Adam, right? But he is of the ancient of days, the eternal God, perfect in glory, honor and majesty, holiness, right? It's so, it's so important because the perfection of the qualities of who he truly is in his pre-incarnate state and the state that he continued to be as he lived in this world is, is so important because he becomes the only one who ever lived that can pay the price for the guilt and the sin of mankind. The only one. That's the importance of the humanity of Christ. Hebrews tells us in the second chapter in verse 14, in as much then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, that's us, right? And as much as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that is Christ, likewise shared in the same. He goes on to say in verse 17, that therefore in all things he is made, so in all things he had to be made like his brethren. In all things he was made like us. And we get to the fourth chapter with that wonderful exhortation that reminds us that he at all points was tempted yet without sin. So in becoming a man, Christ was making himself subject to the law of God. Paul said that in the, in the book of Galatians, when he said in verse, chapter 4 and verse 4, but when the fullness is a Christmas verse again, isn't it? But in the fullness of time, so when the fullness of time had come, I was at the appointed time, determined within the Godhead in eternity past, before the creation existed. Right? But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under what? The law. To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We might become sons and daughters of God. Being born under the law, living under the law without sin, he alone could fulfill the law's requirements of perfection. And he might become our substitute, our sacrifice. You see, Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul tells us the Old Testament law was intended to cause us to feel the weight of our sin. Do you feel it? Or have you felt it? Before you came to Christ? Because that's what should have brought you to Christ. The weight of your own sin. Your inability to deal with the brokenness of, of who we are. Right? And so Paul in Romans 7 highlights that for us. While Jesus would tell us in, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 that he came to fulfill the law. So the weight of the law is what is to bring, was to condemn us and bring us to Christ. But Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that he came. He was also under the weight of the law. He subjected himself to the law, but fulfilling the law. That's why he came. He came to fulfill the law. He said, don't, you th don't think that I came to destroy the law and the pro of prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but I came to fulfill them. See, God intends us through the law to see and feel the depth of our own depravity that we might run to Christ. We might run to Christ and depend upon his grace and depend upon his forgiveness. Jesus was not merely another man whose sacrifice inspired us to be better people. Unfortunately, that's how many people view him. I'm going to say that again. He was not just another man whose sacrifice inspires us to be better people. No, 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 no. Jesus is the sinless, 
Son of God, who truly became fully human in order to save us. He came for us. He came from glory and he came for me. Can you say that? Yeah. He came from glory and he came for us. And not only that, and this is the staggering thing, well, it's all staggering. Seems to be my word at the moment, doesn't it? He came to serve us. He said, even the Son of Man did not be, did not come to be served, but to serve. You, let me tell you, let me ask you, let me tell you, next time you're worshipping God amongst the fellowship of the believers, and you're lifting your heart before the throne of grace, and you're enamoured by his love, just stop for a minute. And think that. You're trying to serve me. I, I promise you. It'll break you. It really will. This is who Jesus is. This is what he came to do. He is the eternal king of glory. And he did not come to be exalted or to be waited upon. Rather, he came in the form of a humble servant. And you look at him. Walking amongst the creation, walking amongst humanity. He healed the sick. He delivered people. He fed the hungry. He calmed the not of the storms, but he calmed the fears within men's and women's hearts. He played no favoritism, did he? He played no favoritism. His compassion was directed towards whoever came to him, towards everybody. Men, women, children, Jew, Gentile, the healthy, the sick, the rich, the poor, the educated, the uneducated. He served everybody. But his servant humility probably is nowhere typified more than on that final evening. Remember? In the upper room with the disciples that gathered there for the Last Supper. And again, the disciples were arguing amongst themselves who's greater, who's more important. Remember? Right on that last night. Right? And it seems without a word, you, follow, you track through it in John's Gospel, it seems without a word said to anybody, Jesus raises himself up from the supper and washed their feet. And then he said to the disciples, I've given you this example that you might likewise do to one another. Let me read this, Luke's Gospel 22, 24. This is Jesus responding again to their squabbles. And there was also a dispute amongst them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the king of the Gentiles, they exercise lordship over them. This is the world's system, right? They exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. We see this everywhere, right? They benefit from those that they have authority over. See it everywhere, don't you? Sadly, you see it in certain quarters of the church. You've got people begging for money. You've got people constantly pressuring people to give. And they're going out and buying very nice cars, <laughs> very nice houses. Very nice chairs. Yeah. No, no, no. They're benefactors from those that they lord it over. That's the world's way. That's Elon Musk getting up before people. I saw this the other day. It's an old clip. I saw it the other day. He gets up and he goes, I, I guess I don't need to tell you who I am, but I am Elon Musk. And then he proceeded to tell them everything that he has done for them. Yeah. It's all free long. No. That's the world's way, right? Called benefactor. But he says in verse 26, but not so amongst you. On the contrary, he who is greatest amongst you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table, or he who serves? It's not he who sits at the table, yet I am amongst you as one who serves. 
You see, no one at that meal that night was greater than Jesus. No one. In fact, there has never on this planet ever existed another being on this planet greater than Jesus, right? And yet here he is with them as the one who serves. You see, what Jesus teaches us is that the kingdom of God is fueled by servanthood. Servanthood, right? We must serve each other in humility and kindness. We must put aside our positions on the totem pole. How tragic it is that even within the church we've got a totem pole that we're climbing up. No, we put aside position. We put aside all of those things and say this. Can we say this? This is why I ask you to pray for the person next to you. Can we genuinely look at that person next to us and say, I'm here for you. Don't even know you. Some of you in this room don't even know the person that you were praying for. And I'm here for you. This is the kingdom of God. This is what it's all about, right? Someone said this, as Christians we should be symbiotically dependent on one another through our acts of service to one another. When we demand things through power and position, we fail to follow the model of Jesus Christ and we fail to serve our brethren and sisters. Jesus said to the disciples, arguing over positions, whoever desires to become great amongst you shall be your servant. Slave. Slave. He's asking his disciples to offer themselves voluntarily to serve one another. Because that's what he did. Philippians. Don't we love Philippians chapter 2? Verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, here it is, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Others first, and Jesus would say, us last. Again, regardless of our position and our title, or where we sit in the scheme of things, this is the message for the disciples then, as it is the message for you and I today. Again, again Jesus is above anyone else. Right? And above anyone else, he has the right to be served. Isn't that right? You know, Philippians again is going to tell us that every knee shall bow, right? Every tongue will confess. Peter tells us that he committed no sin and, and, and there was no deceit found in him at whatsoever. And then John will tell us that all things came into existence through him. And again, Paul would tell us in, Col in Colossians that by him all things are, by him all things consist. He holds everything together. This is Jesus, right? This is the one that is holding himself up here as the servant of all. The King of kings, the Lord of all. If anyone throughout all of creation, from the beginning of time, should be served, it should be Jesus Christ. But to show... The example of how we should interact with one another. He willfully chose to serve us. And again, he says, I serve as an example here, which tells we must likewise be an example to one another. My earthly father would often say to me, do as I say, not as I do. Remember that statement? Do as I say, not as I do. And that being because like all of us, I'm not picking on my dad, but being like all of us, his sayings and his doings were not always in harmony. Huh? Not so with Christ. Not his example. Not the example that he's given for us to follow. We must realise that others will never completely understand what servanthood is Unless, please hear this, unless they see it and experience it. The church and the unbelieving world doesn't need teaching on the subject. You know that? They don't need teaching on the subject of servanthood. They need demonstrations. That's what they need. They need to see servanthood lived out 
in the flesh and for that to touch their lives. Again, that's what Jesus did, isn't it? He got up from the meal. He got up from the meal. He took off his outer garments. He wrapped a towel around himself. He poured water into a basin. He began to wash his disciples' feet. And we are called to serve this way, to serve in the lowliest of positions, because that's what that was, the job of the servant. And we are called to live like this before one another by getting on our hands and knees and doing things that no one else would do. It's a high calling now, isn't it? But no one else would do. In the very moment, here's the thing, in the very moment that we do that is the moment of teaching. That's when we teach what it means to be a servant to someone. It happens from the top down. And that's what Jesus was teaching. When leaders teach, when leaders, teachers, and those at the top serve, then others begin to get it. But when, the, when those that are up high are just waiting for it, oh, look, I've got a thousand examples in my head, and I know it's hot and stuff in here. There's still hot and stuff in here. Are you all right? No. I won't do that. But there's a warning to be given here. Because you can do something serving on your hands and knees. You can do this. You can be doing the dirty work, so to speak. You know, but it's not really dirty work, right? But you can be doing it, trying to lead by example... But the problem is everything that you do and you say is communicating, please look at me. Please recognise what I'm doing. Right? I'm only someone who is humble. No, no, no. no. Please, no, no, no. Uh, look how mature I am. Look, look, I need to be noticed. I mean, I drove into church this morning and there was Rod, and I know he doesn't want me saying this, but there was Rod out there with a shovel in his hand cleaning up the car park. No one's asked him to do that. And I watch, and I watch any number of you doing that sort of thing all the time. Right? Not looking for anything, not expecting any. No, no, no. No. no let, let's be careful. Let's check our motivation. Let's know why we do this. Because we want to express, we want others to experience, experience Christ in us, right? So let me read again. How am I going? Let me read again um, Philippians, because I want to read this. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition, chapter 2, verse 3. I want to let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you. Did you notice that? Let this mind be in you. It is a choice. There's a commitment of mind that you make. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. I, I read that passage regularly. And I stop and I think, because I, it doesn't go far enough in my mind. Because you know, I think about who Jesus was as the servant that came. Yes, he was that glorious, glorious being who vowed himself in flesh and humbled himself. And everything that Paul says there, everything that Paul says, emptied himself of that outward display of glory, lived amongst us, being found in the appearance of a man, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. But before the point of death, you know, it was also to the point of being rejected, to the point of being spat upon, to the point of being abused and persecuted. 
No. Being a servant cannot be about us. It can never be about you. It can never be. We're not servants of one another so that we can sleep better at night. Because sometimes we do, right? You hear me say it all the time, you know. We need to be able to lay our head on the pillow at the end of every night and know that we have been faithful to our God and pleased our God. That is true, but often behind that there is this motivation. Oh, I've done well. This is why I do it. No, no, no. Yes, I do want to do well. And yes, that is part of why I do it. But my example is before me. And he did more than simply come and die in my place. Second, we make it about ourselves, about our glory, about our recognition, about our time. That moment we fail to communicate God's love. Look, there's a voice. I'm, I'm saying this, I'm laboring because there's a voice in us that says, hey, you deserve recognition. I want you to know it's not God's voice. You know that, right? Because we do. I do. I've slaved all day long. Don't they know that? Don't they know I work a job during the week? Don't they know? They're, they're, all of you, there's a part of you that look at how good I am. No. No, no, no. Our faith, our actions, our service, it's got to be a reflection of Christ in us. It's got to be. And I don't think I have anything else to say to you this morning. I really don't. Um, there's talkings, there's rumblings of revival. Um, and I wanted to say this this morning. Some of you have been following what's happening in Kentucky. Right? And I have too with interest because we pray for revival in this church all the time. But I'm only saying this right now because... You know, and I'm hearing good reports and I'm seeing good things take place. Um, revival can't just be about us. It can't just be about the experience of us. And that's what happens with these things. You know, because if, you, if some of you that are following might notice people are coming from far and wide to experience. And I understand that. But if that experience doesn't transform the person, and you know one of the key, historically, key um, um, markers of genuine revival? Is what we've been talking about this morning. Is when people go back to their lives and they begin to serve, right? They begin to serve. See, if this church was in, re in revival, we would never be standing before you saying, we need volunteers in the children's church. Poor Marty wouldn't have to be saying that all the time. We need volunteers here. Need... No, no, no. If this church was in revival, then everybody is about the kingdom business. You know, I have actually heard in, 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 in past revivals of people, you know, being upset because they can't get involved. Because, so every, in, in, you know, revival is small, revival is large. It begins, revival takes place in an individual life, it takes place in an individual church, it takes place globally like we saw in the Welsh revival. All these things are true. But I've heard of, 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 of revival, church alive, and people getting upset because they can't get on a roster to serve somewhere in the church. <laughs> Let's look for that in this revival. The lives are changed and the lives, of, the lives of communities change, things like that. Oh, look at that. Sorry. I've, I have waffled terribly. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I didn't even get to that. Um, God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. Please pray for little Zoe. Pray for little August. Um... um now let me think, I've got to get this right. Louise?
Louise, Olivia, um, Caitlin, Louise, Liv Liv Olivia, Caitlin. If I've missed someone, I'm sorry. I'm carrying babies right now. And you need to be praying for them.